Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Teresa Marantet, CEO and Chief Nursing Officer of the Windsor-Essex County Health Unit. I will now report our current case counts. There are 786,417 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Canada and 270,925 cases in Ontario. Chatham-Kent has 1,225 cases and Sarnia Lambton has reported 1,845 cases. Michigan now has 562,510 cases with 28,830 cases being in Detroit. Today we are reporting 39 new cases of COVID-19 in Windsor and Essex County. 11 are close contacts of confirmed cases. 10 cases are related to outbreaks. Three are community acquired and 15 cases are still being investigated. We have had 12,233 cases since last March. 11,449 cases are now resolved and 452 people are active cases at this time. 68 confirmed cases are currently in the hospital and nine people are in ICU. Today we are reporting an additional six deaths. Five people are from the community, a man in his 60s, a woman in her 70s, and three men in their 80s. And one person is from a long-term care home, a woman in her 80s. Our community has lost 326 people to COVID. 216 deaths have occurred among residents and staff in long-term care and retirement homes. There are currently 39 active outbreaks in Windsor and Essex County. 16 are in workplaces, 17 are in long-term care and retirement homes, and there are six outbreaks in our hospitals. To provide a brief update on the vaccine rollout, our health unit has been working with long-term care homes to complete second doses. So far, eight homes have been visited and an additional three homes will receive their second doses today. Please continue to follow public health measures. Stay home, stay home if you're sick, limit your close contacts to your household members only, maintain a two meter distance from others, wash your hands often with soap and water or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer, wear a non-medical mask or face covering, cover your mouth and nose with a tissue or use the inside of your elbow when you cough or sneeze, and download the COVID exposure alert app at canada.ca. If you have any symptoms, symptoms of COVID-19, no matter how mild, please get tested by calling or booking an appointment online at one of the assessment and testing centers offered at Windsor Regional Hospital or Erie Shores Healthcare. SOHAC in Windsor also offers testing for First Nations, Métis and Inuit people in their families. I will now turn it over to Dr. Wajid Ahmed, our Medical Officer of Health. Good morning and thank you for joining us. As we continue to see COVID-related deaths in our community, it is really important for us to ensure that we are doing everything to protect our most vulnerable. As the case, case rates coming down in our region, we must not lose focus on keeping our community safe and keeping our most vulnerable safe. I want to make sure that I emphasize just like I did in early November and warn that COVID-19 cases increase exponentially. And if we don't follow the public health guidelines, the, spread, the, the cases can spread very quickly and the spillover negative impact of all these cases will be in our long-term care homes, retirement homes, age of 80 to 89, which is 421.9 uh, deaths per 100,000 population, followed by between 70 to 79, 98.9, and then between 60 to 69 is 29.6. So if we can see that there's a, a, the effect of gradient the older you are, and if you contract COVID, the likely you are to die with it. In our region, 96% of the deaths uh, happen in individuals that were 60 years and older, and out of these, 64% of these individuals were over the age of 80. Based on all these numbers, I wanna make sure that uh, the, the provincial task force understand and recognize the importance of uh, prioritizing the vaccine based on the age. And, and now I'll move on to my school data presentation.
So looking at our epi curve, this includes uh, not only the school age children, but everyone who lives in Windsor and Essex. And as we can see that uh, we have seen a sharp increase in the number of cases over the month of December, continuing on in the month of January. But now we're starting to see uh, a decline in the number of cases and with our uh, daily case rates, a seven day moving average, hovering somewhere around 50 cases a day. Looking at the cumulative cases, we have seen a huge increase and a uh, very steep curve, but then we are starting to see some flattening of the curve, uh, the early indication of that. Um, and again, all of this is dependent on the measures that are currently in place and the, the restrictions that are currently in place showing the positive uh, benefit of uh, reducing the case counts and reducing the hospitalization and uh, the mortality associated with that. Our week over week uh, uh, case rates, as you can see, we have seen a huge increase, but now these, this number is coming down. And currently, based on the most recent estimate, our number of, uh, of uh, week, uh, our case rate by the last week was 82.9 cases per 100,000 population, which has gone down. As you can see, that there was a time when our case rate was close to 360 um, uh, cases per 100,000 population per week. Similarly, looking at our person positivity rate, there was a time when we had the highest person positivity rate in the province, uh, which is now trending downward. And we are uh, uh, right now, our overall community person positivity is around 5%. Now, focusing just on the school age data uh, for the children, and as we can see, we have similar picture in terms of the trajectory of the graph, the number uh, obviously change, but overall, when we're looking at the trajectory, we have seen a huge spike in the number of cases in the month of uh, late, uh, late November, early, Jan uh, early December, and then continuing on in the month of uh, early phase of January, and then started to see a decline in the number of cases as we continue to see uh, all these measures uh, uh, giving us a, a positive impact of all the cases in the community. So when we merge those two graphs together with uh, the overall cases, versus the uh, school age cases. And as we can see similar picture, we started to see an increase in the uh, number of cases or the proportion of cases in the school age children, much at a higher rate of increase uh, end of November and continuing on in the early month of December. But then as we can see that that effect is now um, um, it, it, that, that similar effect is no longer there. In fact, our school age cases are dropping below the the our overall case rate so which is a good sign suggesting that there is a minimal or uh, low risk uh, with respect to the school age children in particular when we're talking about any benefit of them returning back to the school so plotting this graph by the reported timeline and overall activity so obviously when we opened up the school in in September timeline that's where the time, initial timeline starts with minimum number of cases we have seen then when the, there was a switch in learning mo mo model happened with more students uh, returning to school with the with the Catholic schools and other school boards um, um, opened up the switch the online learning model there were many students who switched to in person learning and unfortunately, that was the same timeline when we start to see cases in the community post Halloween um, and uh, other events that happened in the uh, cases in the month of January, which is again, when we are looking at from an overall community perspective versus looking at just the school age children, that number is, uh, is, uh, is not there in comparison with the, with the overall community picture. And overall, when we are looking at the age breakdown, where these uh, 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 and the age group that is impacted most, it's between the 14 to 18 age uh, age group, which is the typically the high school students uh, that are impacted more, followed by the 9 to 13. But even in January, as we can see, that the effect is is getting minimal in terms of uh, the uh, those two age groups, and returning back to where they normally are generally with the um, number of cases not showing in one particular age group versus the other. Uh, looking at the exposure sources of school age children, uh, this helps us to understand where these, how these children are acquiring the disease. 
So most of the cases, as we can see in November, uh, it's a mix of household contact, which is again, no surprise because the children don't necessarily have the same number of exposure that is happening um, um, outside of their home. Most of their exposures are happening inside the home. They, we can see in the month of November, uh, a large portion of cases is a result of outbreak related. So that's, uh, that's because of the two school that went into outbreak in the month of November. And then overall, we, have, we didn't see many cases that are linked to the outbreak, but mainly the exposure source continued to be with the, uh, from their household contact, as well as uh, um, the close, uh, close contact pieces where they, where they acquired the disease. And similar trend continued in the month of January. From an overall uh, daily test perspective, we've seen that the test numbers um, are um, are starting to decrease in that age group, particularly, uh, the, and the, the reason mainly is because the due to the exposure, the children are children are not necessarily exposed to the uh, the same risk for to acquire COVID nineteen, so that's why. Um, based on the symptomatic testing, if they don't have the symptom, if they don't have the need for testing, that those numbers will uh, will generally trend down, and this is exactly what we are seeing here. Looking at the person positivity in school age children, when we uh, made the decision to and recommendation to uh, to um, uh, for early closure of the school, we did notice that the the data uh, was showing in a po in, in an upward trend with the case rates increasing, with the person positivity increasing. But now all of that is trending down, and we can see that uh, uh, the overall person positivity continues to stay. At, at a higher level than the general public, but as I mentioned, the case, the, the test numbers are also going down, and most of these test uh, numbers, uh, when it comes to children, are happening only when they have uh, uh, confirmed exposure or if they're symptomatic, and that's why uh, the likelihood of them coming back positive continues to stay, uh, to remain high. When we are looking at the overall emergency department visits and admissions for uh, any respiratory fever, influenza-like illness among the school-age children, we have seen some spike in the emergency department visit between the ages of 5 to 18 in, uh, in late. Thank you. We'll now take questions from the media. Today we'll start with Blackburn. Sorry, not right now, thank you. Uh, any questions from the Windsor Star? Yes, good morning, doctor. Uh, before we get to school-aged children, uh, just about what you said about prioritizing the vaccine earlier. I believe in the rollout plan, essential workers are ahead of older people in the general community when it comes to who will receive any further classification that we need to make. There are some flexibility uh, about that, but then overall, if the province is saying essential cares, essential workers first will come before anyone else, then there's little flexibility on our end to, to change that. Okay, and then moving on to uh, school aged kids. Is there a higher risk now for that population in the classroom than there was in September? Well, uh, as we have always said, the, the risks, uh, we can never eliminate the risk. We can never go to the risk where there is a risk-free environment. And we all do our own risk assessment based on the risks and benefit of taking one measure versus the other. When you have high community case rates, it will have an, a spillover impact on everything that uh, that is currently open in the system, whether we're talking about the school, whether we're talking about the workplaces, whether we are talking about any other type of setting that continues to stay open in the, in a high risk uh, situation. So if looking at just the numbers, so obviously in September, the background case rates were low. The, the background case rates right now is relatively high uh, compared to September. But then we also know that uh, in September, everything was open. Right now, due to the lockdown, due to the stay at home order, there are still many things that are currently closed which is preventing the spread of the disease in the community. And knowing that information, if we have to say that 
is it okay to continue to keep our children at home and uh, compromising on some of the educational attainment issues uh, with some children, not all, um, that, uh, that would benefit more for the in-person learning. We know in-person learning in general is more beneficial, but even for some, some students can do well with even when they're doing online learning, some don't. There are additional skills that are there, are additional learning that happens when students are there in, for in-person learning. So we want to make sure that uh, this is not a limiting barrier, especially when things are starting to move in the right direction. Uh, and again, it is all subject to what happens in the community, what else, what other restrictions are in place, and what are some of those measures that are put in place to ensure that um, even if we have a case in the school, is it contained? Can we contain it? And what are the risks that we can, what are the measures that we can take to reduce the risk for even introducing one case in the school system? So all of those uh, measures are important and I want to make sure that you, you, maybe you and some others are looking for a clear answer. There is no clear answer. We have to do our own risk assessment. We have to think about what how it will impact my child, how much risk I'm willing to tolerate. Um, overall, based on the evidence, based on the data, based on the various reports, including reports from the sick kids, it is important that children do online, uh, sorry, children uh, do in-person learning and uh, that measures the, the that are currently in place, uh, the public health measures, it helps to mitigate any risk of uh, spread in the, in the school system and uh, we have to continue to follow these measures to keep uh, to keep our school systems safe. And then finally, in your opinion, how well were schools able to prevent outbreaks in the first um, when they first returned to school? I know there were a lot of cases in schools, and not not that not as many outbreaks as cases in schools. Well, I think uh, when the physical distancing, when the uh, IPAC measures, cohorting, and uh, uh, the community background case continues to stay low, all these measures work. It never lead to. It doesn't lead to uh, uh, outbreaks for the most part. Even though class dismissals, class cohorts, uh, uh, cohorts dismissal happening at all time, but very rarely it led to an outbreak and uh, an outbreak that uh, resulted in large number of people exposed. That never happened. Uh, any kind of lapse in any of these measures, whether the uh, parents are not screening their children and if they're sending them sick, if the teachers, if they are not screening themselves and if they're coming to school sick, if they're not maintaining their physical distancing with the children, that's uh, that's a problem. If uh, children, if they're mixing cohorts, that's a problem. If the children are failing to adhere to the uh, physical distancing piece, that's a problem. In the beginning, in September, I think the compliance to follow all these measures were pretty good. But as we continue to move forward in, in October and November, with the with some good signals that uh, uh, you know our schools are uh, operating well, there's no additional risk. We, uh, we, we, we figured out that maybe all of these measures were not followed uh, by everyone. So I think it's important that we go back to the same drawing board. We talk about it. We say how we can maybe re-educate. Maybe how do we, maybe we can reinforce some of these measures to make sure that people continue to follow. And that includes the staff also as well as the students. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions from AMA 100? Dr. Ahmed, I know the province is releasing the plan later today for the hotspot areas. And like you just said, it's basically everyone has to make their own decisions based on the risk assessment. But maybe a yes or no answer here. I'm not sure if I missed it. Are you recommending in-person learning returns? Well, as I shared yesterday, Rob, uh, as part of the Medical Officers of Health, uh, Council of Medical Officers of Health, we do feel that uh, the in-person learning is uh, important. And uh, given what we are seeing in our community, I think our community, uh, um, with all these other restrictions in place, uh, can open up the schools. So if uh, these restrictions stay in place, uh, the current restrictions, and who knows, maybe additional restrictions, uh, you feel it's safe enough, confident uh, parents uh, can uh, send their kids back? 
Well, as I said, uh, Rob, uh, it's, uh, you know, the my risk assessment versus someone else's risk assessment can differ. Uh, and people may think that even having some of these measures is still not enough, there should be more. Um, so there, you cannot get one simple answer to say that, yeah, everyone feels that safe. What I can tell you is all these measures that are already, already in place and, uh, ha and with the variables obviously is what's happening in the community and how people are adhering to these measures. Those measures are designed to prevent any type of uh, uh, spread in the school. We'll, we can, we'll continue to have cases. We'll continue to see children bringing cases to the school, but all, all these measures are being followed. It won't, it should not result in a spread of the disease as uh, we have seen uh, in, in the month of November and uh, with some of the outbreaks. But generally speaking, even like to, across the province, even with all these cases, the number of outbreaks continued to stay in a level where, uh, which was uh, easily manageable and didn't result in any, any adverse outcomes. For you, uh, maybe taking off the medical of health uh, hat, uh, and obviously use your father hat. And when you talk to your kids about this, how how are they feeling, and how are you feeling? Well, as I said, you know, we have to have to do our own um, uh, uh, risk assessment, looking at my child, what his needs are, and even um, being the father of three children, um, my three children are not the same. One would. Uh, be completely fine saying that, nope, I'm good, just continuing on with my online learning. And the other child can say, no, I'm not good with the online learning, I want to go back to school. So I think it's a tough one. I can't really say that uh, um, that's the decision that everyone will make, but uh, using my my role as the medical officer of the FAL and looking at what is happening and overall risk and benefit for the community and the, the broader risk to the population um, of the red recommendation to open the school and to uh, switch to um, uh, or having the ability to send kids for in-person learning, uh, that's the right thing to do at this time. Thank you. Any questions from CTV? Yes, good morning. Um, if the provincial recommendation for schools is different than what you think should be in place for our region, would you consider issuing your own order again? Um, I cannot, um, let's just put it this way, I cannot undo what the province is doing. So for example, if the province decide to keep the school closed, I can't do anything because that's a provincial order. I cannot go and change it and open things up. But let's say if the province decide that they wanna keep the school open and based on the local risk, at some point, if I feel that no, I need to close the school down, so I can do that. So it's, it's, it's tricky that how, uh, some of these balance are. And if we want to simplify it, it's based on the risk. So if the risk is there for me to say that uh, uh, keeping the school open is a risk for the community, I do have that um, um, ability to do that. But other than that, uh, the provincial direction, I think we'll have to we'll have to work with the province to make sure that uh, either they don't give any direction, so that I don't have to do uh, a, 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 a my part and make those local recommendations or have a recommendation which uh, works well for everyone. Okay, and as far as what is the role of the health unit for when schools do return? I believe it went over in September. Will it be the same as it was, I guess, before Christmas? Everything will kind of go back into place the way it was before? Okay, I'll pass it on to Teresa to answer this question. Um, so yes, we still have the school nurses that will support the schools and we have all the protocols in place. We um, have communication with all of the school boards. So we will continue to work with the schools as students return to school to in-person school. Great, thank you. Any questions from CBC? We're not there yet, but I wanted to ask about the vaccination rollout for the general population of seniors. I'm wondering um, what the outreach will look like there, whether there's a plan to contact seniors who live alone, um, how the health unit will make sure that they're getting those vaccines. 
So I'll start off and then I'll let Teresa answer some of these uh, uh, details as well. So I think uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, We're trying to work with the uh, primary care providers to, uh, to look at uh, their population first and identify the uh, seniors at risk and then start vaccinating them uh, when, the, when we have the supply for, uh, for, for, those, uh, for that population. So that's how it will start, but there will be other ways for us to reach out to that population. I'll let maybe Teresa add uh, additional details. Oh, well, that's exactly it. So our, our rollout plan involves the primary care providers and also pharmacies. So as we receive uh, further confirmation from the province about the vaccine and the distribution of the vaccine, we will engage our um, healthcare professionals and they have the ability to reach out to their clients as well or their patients. So we will use all the avenues um, that we have used for vaccine, uh, like flu influenza uh, vaccine rollout and uh, continue to communicate and use our media partners as well to help uh, with the message regarding the prioritization and how to access um, your COVID vaccine. And I also had another question, if possible. Sure. Uh, I'm wondering. I'm wondering about uh, the uh, testing in the region. Are we seeing further decline? Do you expect uh, to be uh, saying that testing numbers have declined a bit more in that uh, epidemiological report on Friday? We can share that number on Friday, but I think, as I said, uh, based on what to expect uh, based on the symptoms and the likelihood of how people are contracting COVID-19. It's a possibility that we may see um, uh, some decline in the number of uh, tests uh, for these assessment centers, which which is not necessarily a bad thing which basically means that there are people who are less symptomatic uh, or people who are who don't have the uh, symptom that requires testing for COVID. But if there are people who have symptoms that are suggestive of COVID, if there are people who are identified as a close contact of a confirmed case, and if there is any other reason for people to think that they, are, uh, that they um, may have COVID, I think there are opportunities for them to get tested. So right now, based on the epidemiology and the number of less number of active cases right now we are gone down to I forgot like the number which Teresa mentioned I think it's close to 400 some uh, close to 400 right now and at one point we have to remember we had 2700 active cases so that number has gone down the likelihood of uh, someone being a close contact of those 400 cases or uh, someone uh, with symptoms is low and for them to get tested would be low so it's kind of expected that the numbers will drop, but we don't want this to be an opportunity for people not to go for testing. I think we still want people who have the symptoms to go for testing. So we continue to stay on top of all these cases and prevent any spread in the community. Thank you. Any further questions from Blackburn? Yeah, sorry about that. I was with that at home schooling crisis. <laughs> Um, just about the vaccines, the health unit was expecting another shipment of um, the Moderna vaccine this week. Has that arrived yet? Um, we do have confirmation that it's coming, but it has not arrived yet. Okay. Um, I think everything else has been asked and answered. Thank you. Any further questions from the Windsor Star? No, thank you. Any hundred? No, thank you. Any further questions from CTV? No, thank you. CBC? No, thank you. Thank you, everyone.